Hello, and welcome to RISE Radio. I'm your host, Kate Christensen. RISE is a global community of entrepreneurs and innovators who are working together with Barclays to create the future of financial services. We're curious about what's new in tech and what it means for the future of money. In this podcast, we will explore and explain how these emerging technologies work and what they mean for the future of banking, straight from the mouths of the people who are trying to disrupt the industry. Last week, I had the distinct pleasure of recording my first ever episode with a live audience. It was a thrill and I learned a lot. I sat down with John Stein, founder and CEO of Betterment. We talked about his company, the wealth advising space in general, the future of robos, and so much more. The audience was fantastic and asked some really great questions, which you'll hear at the end of this recording. It was really fun to do a live interview, so there will certainly be more here at Rise New York. Stay tuned for announcements on upcoming events, and in the meantime, enjoy the FinTech Enlightenment. Can you hear me? Everyone, welcome to Rise. Thank you so much for coming and spending your precious breakfast hours with us. My name is Kate Christensen, and I joined Barclays two years ago to launch Rise, which is the US hub of our open innovation program. We have seven sites globally where we work with entrepreneurs to connect, co-create, and scale emerging technologies in the fintech realm. And we exist to future-proof our bank and the rest of our peers in the financial services industry. One of the many things I do here at Rise is host Rise Radio, which is our content platform and the premier fintech podcast available on iTunes, Google Play, and SoundCloud. And I interview fintech founders and subject matter experts to demystify fintech and just explain in an approachable and amusing way what these emerging technologies are, how they work, and why we care about them in the banking world. So I'm really excited to be joined here by John for our first ever episode recorded in front of a live studio audience. I've got a bunch of questions here, and then I'll be opening it up after about 40 minutes for questions. So keep your comments brewing, because I'm sure John's ready to answer all the hard-hitting stuff. (laughs) I wanted to do a quick plug for a partner we're working with this month. As you know, it's Women's History Month, and we're working with the UN Women Foundation to run a donation for the he for she group. And out here on the bar, there's a little black and silver dip jar where if you just dip your credit card in, it sends an automatic $5 donation to he for she. So we'd love to help them, make them happy today. So on your way out, feel free to dip it. If you don't think it works, just dip it a bunch more times. And uh, (laughs) we'd love to support them. So John, I start out every interview on my show with security questions like the password reset questions of what's your mother's maiden name, what street did you grow up on, but a little more personalized. So what is your favorite ETF? Oh, goodness. Um, (laughs) I'm going to say tip because we have it on on the towels in the bathroom. We actually have, um, when we made our office here, and we're neighbors, right? We're just two doors down from you guys. We designed this office, and there was a deal at one of these like online, you know, print places to get things initials put on towels. And we had maybe ten tickers in the portfolio at the time, and we just put all of those different ones on on towels. So uh, it was just kind of a fun, a fun thing. The whole office is old, old finance themed, and so we have a bunch of those. But I wash my hands with tip all the time. <laughs> Not bad. What is the name of your Wi-Fi network at home? Let's see. It's my address. It's 49 Ludlow 9B. And, uh, That's and boring. If, you're, if you're visiting me, the, uh, the, the password is Chinatown. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and how's your March Madness bracket ranking in your office pool right now? Awful. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I didn't even get in this year. Uh, I, was, uh, oh. I was too late to, uh, to, to get into the bracket. Oh, pity. Well, you'll look better with these next questions that uh, I'll ask. Um, can you tell us what does Betterment do and why did you start it? Betterment is the largest independent online investment manager. Mm -hmm. We are transforming investing, taking all the best practices that you should be using to manage your money and delivering them for you in an automated, seamless, easy-to-use package. It's, in my view, the way 
everyone should invest in the way people want to manage their money. In the past, it hasn't been accessible. But through technology and through uh, the efficiencies that technology brings, we're making advice that's aligned with you, all the best practices that you should be doing, accessible to anybody and everybody. Fantastic. And how long have you been at it? And why did you start out? I started because I was investing on my own uh, after I got a little bit of college graduation money. And I had like seven different brokerage accounts over the years. And I was doing you know, some, some good things and some really dumb things. I famously bought Enron on the way down. Huh. And I found that I was subject to the same kinds of behavioral biases that I learned about in my college classes. I studied economics, but also behavioral biology. And I realized that at the macro level, economics explains the world very well and is a great framework for understanding things. But at a micro level, I don't think it's a great model oftentimes because it doesn't account well for behavior. And there's plenty of, of smart people who've written about this. I just saw it applied very directly to my financial life, and, to, and, and there wasn't a solution available that actually did account well for how I actually wanted to invest and in, in the things that I thought. I mean, people historically uh, and, and generally. Yeah, give uh, us a history of what wealth advising has looked like. Oh, goodness. A quick, a quick history. <laughs> so going way back, I mean, I love this. I love, I love uh, looking at the, at the history of the space. I think a lot of wealth management and investing has arisen accidentally. It's come out of forms and regulations that were meant for large institutions and then applied over time to individual investors. And it hasn't been very thoughtfully constructed. As a, for instance, we have uh, 401ks in this country, which you know came out of pensions and it was just kind of, we had modified the regulation to make it accessible to everyone and then encourage everyone to save $18,000 a year tax-free in a retirement account. But when we rolled that out in the 80s, really it was about shifting burdens away from, the, uh, from companies and, and off of government and onto individuals. But we didn't give individuals any tools to understand really how much they should be saving given their age and income and all these kinds of things. We didn't give them a sense of, of what to invest in or how to manage their emotions through different investments. We didn't tell them Do you about. have an emotion management platform yet? Of course we do. I mean, we're, we're, this is something that's really great about, about Betterment. We look at the average in investor underperforms the market by something like 2% per year. They give up, you know, it depends on the study. Some say they give up as much as half of the returns that they should be earning because of market timing and bad investor and bad behavior. We see in a conservative estimate of 2% at Betterment, customers only give up maybe 0.22% because of market timing and that bad behavior. So it's an additional one and a quarter percent per year that our customers earn over customers of other firms. And that in, in, includes all the big firms who release this kind of, uh, of data about their customers. So we've done a lot to help our customers make better decisions, behave better. We tax optimize for you. We tell you how much to save in what accounts. And then we manage that for you over time to make sure that you're on track to whatever it is that you're saving for in life. The history question, I want to get to the, where we are today. Okay. I think for a long time, wealth advisors have existed. And they've existed really just for the very wealthy. And part of that is because they didn't scale. The firms that approached the mass market were mutual fund companies, banks, and brokers. And all three of those firms are selling you something, right? The mutual fund companies are selling you whatever funds they're packaging up, the banks are selling you their products, and the brokers are selling you whatever makes them the highest commission. The advisors, people who could afford good advisors, were getting great financial advice, but that fiduciary financial advice costs, on average, $10,000 a year, which means it's not accessible to most people. And that seemed to me to be a real gap in the market. Everyone wants advice. It's too expensive for them to get it. So Betterment is really the first at scale investment advisor that's able to deliver advice to everyone because we've made it more efficient through technology. And I think that is the future of financial services broadly. I think this advised model is what's taking over in financial services. Definitely. 
I want to go back to something you mentioned about studying economics and psychology in college. It's obviously something you're excited about and perhaps even led by. What are you learning about the literacy of your users and the risk appetite of your users? And are there certain trends among gender, age, assets under management, geography that you're noticing from investors? We have investors of every age, you know, from people who are just starting out to you know, 99-year-olds in every city across the country. We've got almost 250,000 users today. So it's a lot of people, and you get, you get a, a large mix. I think there's a, a common misconception that this type of investing service is for young people mm-hmm. and people who are you know, maybe just starting out. But we think everyone wants good, efficient, well-aligned with them investment mm-hmm. advice. Everyone wants to make the most of their money, right? And in particular, that matters more when you have more money at stake. And so we see something like 30% of our assets come from people who are 50 plus. The vast majority of our assets, 70%, come from non-millennials. It's all coming from from older customers. Millennials aren't driving a tech anymore? (laughs) Well, millennials are our biggest customer base. Mm -hmm. Millennials haven't saved a lot yet. And so we get a lot more money from, from older customers. And that is, that's our fastest growing segment, is the older customers. And we're not surprised by that. We've always thought that this is going to be a product that ultimately appeals to everyone. Mm-hmm. You recently added some service fees offering terrorist pricing for different tiers of service. And I imagine that what was behind this change is what you're learning about a customer's need for human interaction mm-hmm. with wealth advising. Mm-hmm. Could you speak more about what you're learning and why you're changing? A month ago, we launched human advice on the platform. It was surprising for a couple of reasons, the the reaction that we heard. I mean, first, some people said, are you giving up on robo-advice? And, you know, it's kind of a funny question because 95%, not more than that, percent of our customers are still coming to us for the digital solution. And they always will because Mm -hmm. that's the most efficient, the most accessible. That's the one that, you know, anybody can get that. And for basic needs, that's all you, that's all you need. But we started hearing, you know, it's also funny because we've always done this. We've always had advisors. I used to give the advice in the early days when we were a company of four people when when we launched. I would pick up the phone and I'd talk to you about your accounts. And uh, and then as we hired advisors, did anyone talk talk to John on the phone? (laughs) You might still get me if you call today. So actually, everyone at Betterment does uh, customer week. We we go through and everyone's on the phone. So I do this, you know, two two to four times a year. I'll I'll be on the phone talking to customers, answering emails, um, and everybody cycles cycles through that. It's one of the the many ways that we stay close to our customers. Nice. But our our advice offering came out because in those conversations and in conversations outside, uh, you know, with with people who would say to me, I came into Betterment, I really like what you're doing, it it makes a ton of sense, but I just don't know if I can give up my guy that I use over here, like I I need someone to talk to about things. And I say, well, we do that. Don't you know that we do that? Like, just just call us. And we, we have... We have award-winning customer support. We have, uh, you know, seven, seven days a week. We have uh, advisors, CFPs, who will talk to you. But people didn't know that about Betterment. And we had to productize that offering and surface it. And so now it's out there that we offer advice. And some people are surprised by that. And, and again, I, I think that's a little funny because we've never been about not having advice. We've always been about having the best service across everything you can do with your money. We want to give you the absolute best. We just want to make it more efficient. Mm-hmm. And we've made that human component more efficient because of the technology that we've built. I mean, we have the best platform for advisors to come and give advice to clients in an incredibly efficient way. Do you think that wealth management is unique among financial services in a customer's need for human interaction? Because I imagine like remittance payments doesn't take as much <laughs> personal coaching. I, I think it's always been uh, about pairing great advice with good technology. And I think in the traditional advice segment, in the wealth managers, the technology has been really lacking. Mm -hmm. And in the mutual fund or brokerage industry, the advice has been sorely lacking. And bringing those things together in a novel way that makes the advice efficient to deliver to people, I think that's just, I think that's what people are looking for. And, and, And you do still, some, some people, it's a psychographic thing. Some people really want to talk to someone and they want to have the comfort of, I, I know I'm going to get an expert to talk to. It tends to be people who have a feeling that their financial lives are more complicated. 
And some people just say, I just want to, you know, I just want the simplest thing. I want the cheapest thing. I want the most efficient thing. And for them, they're they're going to prefer the the digital offering. Do you think there are other aspects, so of like financial transactions or management that don't need humans? I don't think it's so much about needing humans. It's about what interaction do you want. So some people like having a, a private banker. Some people like talking to their insurance rep. Others like getting those services online and don't want to have to talk to someone. Right. I don't think you have to. I think it's an option if you want to get that, that opinion. And if you're getting that opinion, by the way, you should ask who's giving you that advice. You, you'd better hope that it's not a salesperson, but it's somebody who's actually giving you unbiased advice that's in your best interest. And that's only an advisor can do that. So that's why we think that advisory model is important going forward. How are you guys thinking about chatbots? I love all the AI talk that's going on around natural language processing and responding. It is really interesting. We don't have the budget to hire the you know, 50 million per year salaried folks coming out of Caltech and MIT and whatnot who are you know, building the, the future of artificial intelligence, like Google may. Um, or <laughs> But, someday, um, girl can dream, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Someday, someday. But I, I, it's absolutely influencing the way that we're thinking about the efficiencies that we can find in uh, in our service model. I mean, just just this year, um, our uh, our customer service team is seeing something like uh, twenty five percent fewer inquiries. Even though we've scaled the customer base, I mean, I think we've grown more than more than two x. And that's driven because we've made it just easier to, to serve yourself and get the answers that you want to see. It's still just as easy to call us, too, and you get a person right away. Mm -hmm. But people have fewer questions. And there's a lot you can do to make processes easy for people. And AI is one of those really cool things. Chatbots is one of those cool things. We're, we're excited about all of that. I want to talk about the landscape of disruption in wealth management. We have incumbents like UBS. Credit Suisse, across the park, Morgan Stanley, are they feeling the heat of robos like Betterment yet? And what are your conversations like? I imagine you visit their offices every now and then, or they come to you. When we, when we launched Betterment in 2010, uh, people said, you'll never get this off the ground. Nobody's ever going to trust you to manage any, any money at all. And I thought they were probably right, but, <laughs> but we went for it anyway. And that's uh, advice for all of the founders <laughs> out there. <laughs> We, uh, you know, amazingly, despite the odds, we got, we got that first million dollars and then the, the, the first 10 million. And then people said, well, it'll never get beyond just kind of this, um, you know, niche, niche product. It's not, it doesn't do enough and, and so on. And, and then we got to a billion and people really started to take notice at that point. And today we're at over 8 billion or we're, we're knocking at, at, at 10 and, uh, and growing faster, faster and faster every month. And I think now the conversation is not this won't work. I think actually everyone in the industry, all of the big firms, are racing to get their own entrance into the well, market. Goldman just announced they're building a robo advisor. Right, by posting a job on, on their page, right? It was, it was a, an announcement. Subtle, yeah. <laughs> like I said, on, that, on, on, on the day that we launched, I was asked the question, what do you think uh, about competition? I said, if we are successful, everyone is going to be in this business. We've always known that we're going to have a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. We just know that we're able to deliver it better than the incumbent firms. There was a recent Morgan Stanley um, report a month or two ago that said, uh, you know, advice technology leads to incumbent win. And I loved the headline, incumbent win. <laughs> Patting yourself <laughs> right? on the back. It's so great. Yeah. And, you know, we, we of course, like, sent, sent that around in, internally. The thing that it misses, it, it says that, that uh, this technology, the robo-technology, is going to drive our cost base down by 10 to 20 basis points. But their cost base is at 70 basis points, so that's going to drive them to 50 or 60. So good luck. Right. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we can just do things so much more efficiently than they can. And we're five years ahead in terms of technology development from where they are. And, and, and they have this, this legacy advisor and broker network to support that we don't have to deal with. We can build things the right way from the start, the way customers want them to be, the way they should be for people. And we really think that we're reinventing not just what you do with your money, but financial services around this model of actually working for people, not just doing, you know, not just selling you a product that, that we've made, but doing everything we can to maximize your money. That's what Betterment is. We're working for you. We're working to maximize your money, unlike the traditional firms that just sell you whatever they've got. Mm -hmm. Are you guys going to expand your product set beyond ETF soon to other 
asset classes or just like stock individually? Great question and, and little known that we, we already are doing that. So today you can come to Betterment, you can transfer in just about any type of mutual fund or I individual stock. Uh, we'll hold them for you sometimes. Most of the times, certainly in tax deferred accounts, we'll liquidate them and trade them into a more efficient portfolio. Mm -hmm. But we're doing that to make it easier for people to transfer money in and then easier to build a portfolio around things that you may already have, have or hold. You guys do compete against non-consumption. A lot of them oh, people yeah. don't consider themselves wealthy enough for wealth management, thinking it's something for people who own homes and maybe boats and have friends who manage money to partake of. Who do you see, though, as the still existing non-consumers of wealth management? And are you interested in having them as customers? And what needs to be done from a literacy or education standpoint to acquire them as investors? Right. So there, there's a couple questions. I guess there's the financial education question in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's another thing that's the that non-consumption comes from inertia. I mean, I think sometimes our, our biggest competitor is inertia. Totally. And I think there are a lot of people who use some type of financial services and they've been doing it for a while. Mm -hmm. And honestly, like these are these are knowledgeable, really sophisticated people. And they're doing the thing and they think, this is okay. I'm definitely doing the, the best I can. And there's no other better option out there. And I think that it, there's, there's inertia. And a lot of people don't understand yet that they're not getting everything that they should. Mm -hmm. And so there's work that we have to do to open their eyes to the fact that you may not be uh, you know, being outright exploited. Some people are being outright exploited. Mo most are just being neglected. And they're not actually working with a financial partner who's working for them and optimizing for them every day. So there's this inertia, and we have to open people's eyes. Then there's the financial education piece. I don't think that financial education is the full answer. You, we can give people a semester you know, for everyone in college or in high school about how to buy a mortgage and how to manage credit card debt. And we should do these things, because there's a lot of products out there that are predatory. And you should be right. aware of that. And you should just be aware of the value of compound interest and all these things. But that alone won't make Americans better off. Because in our DNA, we are not well equipped to think about things that happen 50 years in the future. It's just not, it's just, we aren't evolved uh, in a world where we had to plan. We didn't evolve in a world where we had to plan for retirement. We evolved in a world where we had to eat tomorrow. And so we heavily discount the future. And we make emotional decisions when the market falls. And there is no education that can take that DNA out of us. Those, those are our emotions. And that is our discount function. That is programmed into us. Only better products can solve for that. Only products that help you understand the long-term impacts and help you see the trade-offs that you're making. When you make a decision today, what does that mean for the future? And make you feel that in a real way that helps to change the behavior. Only a product can do that. So when does that start? Do you want to create a betterment for teens to help you know, <laughs> high schoolers understand what they should be considering as they start earning money? So I guess when, when I talk about the difference between education and the product, it's, it's about time. The products can educate, right? Seeing the thing in high school or in college and then waiting years until you actually do it, you're going to forget everything uh, before, you, before you do that. I still remember Long Division. <laughs> right. <laughs> All of Charlemagne's right. exploits. <laughs> when you're in the moment, when you're actually about to do the thing, that's when you need the education. That's when the product has to give you the trade-offs and explain to you um, what, what's going on and how to make a better decision. So the education has to come at the moment that you're making the decision. And that's, that's what I mean when I say better products can, can, can do that for us. Going back to something you said earlier about how Betterment is reinventing financial services in general beyond wealth, how do you see banks unbundling? I know mm. you spent time before Betterment doing consulting for a lot of financial institutions. So I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on this topic. I had the best time. I, I used to work for a bank consulting firm called First Manhattan and got to travel the US and the world, you know, telling banks how to make more money. And it was, you know, like, a, I used to joke about that, that it was not the most fulfilling um, uh, uh, <laughs> activity because all the banks were making so much money. And this was 2002 to 2007 or so. Oh, geez. Um, Do you have and, a book deal for that? Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and banks were just like, at, at that time, financial services was 40% of US profits were going to financial services companies, which is a crazy thing when you yeah. think about it. 
because that I think of financial services as basically a, a transaction cost. You know, it should be one or three percent or something like that. Seven percent if you're talking investment banking deals, sure, right? Or home sales, but forty percent, like that's absurd. That's that means for every dollar generated somewhere else in the economy, sixty-six cents was going to financial services. So, like, you know, I saw at that time that something was wrong with that with that math. That there was efficiency to be created, value to be created for consumers. And, uh, and I, I knew that was, was going to be part of my mission. But I was so lucky to get to work with some of the great institutions and understand how they were thinking about th these things. I don't think, to get back to your, to your question specifically, I don't think that banks are going away. I think there's so many smart people working at, at, at banks. Um, they'll be fine. Are you <laughs> right? Barclays folks? And, yeah. and, and, <laughs> But I do think that models will evolve to be more consumer friendly. I think, I mean, look at what you all are doing here. You're innovating, and I think a lot of innovation is about listening to customers and about understanding what, what people want and responding to that. And, uh, and I think banking will, will have to adapt in a way that other industries are adapting to, to customer demands. Do you have an opinion of corporate innovation programs? I realize we're sitting here at <laughs> Rise New York, Barclays hub in the US of open innovation. So feel free to be candid. I understand no, you have, if you you want have to, to do it. It's, it's terrific. I, think, I, I think this is one of the best programs I've seen it's, uh -huh. uh, because it's a, it's a real investment. It's by all uh, external appearances, it's, it's successful. I think you've got to do it because uh, it's too easy. Uh, the, the, the bank clients that I had spent no time talking to customers. I would be on a product development project for months and months and months. And then we'd launch a new mortgage pricing tool to all the bankers. And not once in, the, in that time did we talk to customers about what they thought about it or you know, should, should we change this at all. Um, mm -hmm. It was this very internally money-focused way of thinking about product development. Do you have thoughts on partnerships and white labeling as you talk to banks like us? We have uh, we've partnered with a bunch of folks uh, over the I mean, we have bank partners t today uh, and other, and, and we work with over a thousand uh, in investment advisors who are our partners on the platform we refer customers out to them when people want a dedicated a advisor. So there's lots of ways that, that we're looking at, at partnering with folks. <coughs> Ultimately, we want Betterment to be the financial brand of the next hundred years. We want it to be the place that everyone goes to start their financial searches to, 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 to be the center of their financial lives, we can't do everything on our own. We've got to partner with, with an ecosystem of, of financial providers out there. And as an advisor, we're in a particularly good position to do that. We just want to recommend the best products that are out there. We don't want to make those products. We want to recommend them. Mm -hmm. Do you see, a couple weeks ago, we had a panel on payments. And one of the take-home themes from that was around brand crowding for customers. So when I go to buy something at J. Crew, I don't want to know that it's the Ingenico card processor and that you know the Chase Sapphire folks have to call Visa and Bank of America. I don't want to know all that. I just want to know that I'm getting whatever tortoiseshell accessories at 25% off. <laughs> the only constant in my life right. is J. Crew. Right? <laughs> and so from a payments perspective, they're saying the best thing that we can be is invisible, transparent. We want to be the rails, but we can't work with vendors if we have to stamp our brand also in front of the customer. Do you see that happening with wealth? Like, do you think the path of least resistance for fintech entrepreneurs is to become these, you know, rails that don't chat about themselves, or is it to create your own really trusted brand and kind of launching, or rather, landing pad? There will be success with both approaches. There will be those who white label, and because they can sell similar solutions to a bunch of regional broker dealers or regional banks, they'll find efficiency in selling that platform through. And those, those clients will find efficiency in buying from somebody who's done the software development for them. In general, B2B businesses are the more successful businesses, right? Like they, they tend, they have, higher, they have higher success rates and it's, and it's easier to grow quickly. And so more startups get off the ground that way. I knew that going into this and I still wanted to build a B2C business, right? Like I just, I wanted to connect with customers. I wanted it for me. I wanted the full end-to-end -end experience and I didn't feel 
that I could get that thing that I wanted, which was aligned advice that was working for me all the time, if I had to go through one of the incumbent legacy financial institutions. It wasn't going to happen that way. So we had to build this end-to-end -end experience, and we have to, we have to keep building that way. We, we have to have a, a B2C offering. We can partner with folks, but for us, the path is, uh, is, is always this independent, we are, we are your provider, and we're the full stack. We, we'll, we'll give you all the, all the advice you need comes from us. Mm -hmm. So building a brand that people trust has been obviously critical to your operating and yes. your success. Yeah. I want to talk about politics next, everyone's favorite <laughs> thing du jour. Since President Trump's election, markets have experienced record highs. We've all been watching this coverage in the media. How are you guys at Betterment processing this? And what are you learning from? either directly or indirectly from your investors. It's funny. Every, every time I see my, uh, my uncle, he, he asks me, John, how'd the market do today? And I always say, I don't know. <laughs> because I don't, I don't follow the markets. I really, and, and I just tell that story because we do have a dashboard up in the wall, and I do know if, if the market's having like a, a, a terrible day or, or, or a wonderful day. But I don't follow it day to day, and I don't follow it month to month because we don't try to time the market. We try to put people in the appropriate portfolios for them over the long cycle mm -hmm. and for their goals. And if you're investing in a 20-year retirement goal, it doesn't matter if there was a 10% bounce this month. You're still going to deposit the same amount next month, just as it wouldn't matter if the market fell 20%. Mm -hmm. so you've got a long time to go to save, and actually this is a great time to keep, keep depositing. And if you're in a short-term goal, well, we've got you in a more secure short-term bond portfolio. Right, so then the, the market doesn't really affect you either. It's a happier way to be, to not, to, to not have to worry about where, where, the, where the markets are, are going. It's, it, and, and happiness is part of what, what drives us at, at Betterment. We want to help our customers manage their money to maximize it so that they can live better and be happier. I mean, that's, that's, our, that's our mission. So mm -hmm. part of that happiness is not having to worry about where, where the market went. <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier, as humans, we've evolved to seek out what our next meal is and not mm. save for retirement. And so I do imagine you have customers who are freaking out a bit about this. And so how are you guys preparing both to you know, answer questions and steer people in this boom, but also when the market eventually corrects, how are you bracing for that? Because I'm sure at Betterment, you guys have this long-term understanding, but your customers who are just starting out perhaps are going to freak out a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think all customers, unfortunately, not just Betterment customers, in fact, less Betterment customers than customers of other institutions, our, our customers are super, super sophisticated and smart, right? They're all college educated. Most of them have advanced degrees. Um, they are, you know, they're the, the mass affluent or, or the aspiring mass affluent, aspiring, right? Not rich um, yet, right? They tend to be more than average, well-behaved and, and emotionally controlled in, in market turns. And we do a lot to help them with that. So we're mess proactively messaging around, uh, around market moves because we are aware that, that people are reading the news and, and worried, and, uh, and we want to make sure that they remember that things are okay, remind them of their goals, remind them to stay the course. That's worked well for us. In past downturns where the market's been down 20 or 30% over the last five or six years, we've seen more deposits than, than withdrawals. We've seen uh, higher deposit days than average. I think that we stand, I don't wish a downturn on, on anyone, but I, but I do think that when the next downturn comes, uh, we'll grow faster than, than before, uh, and we'll continue to take share uh, from, from others in, in the market. Hmm. So you tend to see people take a long-term view rather than a panic when things don't look good. Yeah, I, I think everywhere Impressive. people people uh, worry. But if you're you know if you're paying someone for bad service, or you're paying them to sell you product, mm -hmm. and that product doesn't work out, when the market's down, you tend to question them. And a lot of those people, when they're questioning, come to Betterment. Recently, you published an open letter to President Trump about the Department of Labor's proposed fiduciary rule. Can you? Tell our audience here what the rule is, what's at stake, and what your stance is on it for customers. Yeah, the, the fiduciary rule, you, you all, I'm looking at the audience, like definitely know this, this rule by now, but it... Our it, listeners might not, though. <laughs> right. give, it, give it an explanation. It says, in, in essence, that if you're getting advice about 
retirement accounts, 401ks, IRAs, that advice has to be in your best interest or any conflicts have to be disclosed to you, which means that it's harder to, say, bury hidden fees and, uh, and, and sell you product and tell you that this is my advice for you when it's just I'm getting a huge commission for selling you this, this product. It's obviously a good thing. I mean, it's just it's like, it's like putting calorie counts on menus uh, around New York. It just gives you more information. So you know what and you're guilt. actually being charged. Yeah. Um, and you know what you're getting. The estimates from the White House are that consumers will benefit by about $20 billion per year in saved fees if the fiduciary rule goes through. Great. You know, that's obviously, obviously good. Where does that $20 billion come from? It comes from the profits of the companies that were selling you bad product. Great. We shouldn't be selling bad product. At the very least, we should know what we're paying for that bad product. But of course, the people who are stand to lose that $20 billion are spending a lot of it to lobby, to hold up this rule, um, to keep their, their, their profit margins on, on these bad products. Uh, it's clearly a, a rule that's in the best interest of customers, which is why we have been such, um, such vocal advocates for it. It's why we've been involved with the Department of Labor that passed the rule in, uh, in, in shaping it. It's why we've uh, we talked to Congress people on, on both sides of the aisle about our, our support for it and, and other customer-friendly initiatives like it. To zoom out here, it's my last question for yeah. you. Technology as a sector is by staggeringly large margins more trusted than financial services as a sector, pharmaceuticals, even education. And we've seen, especially user-facing technology, experienced a growth in ubiquitousness that is massive over just a short little while. You know, President George W. Bush was the first executive to use email while in office. Wow. <laughs> and since then, we've had the proliferation of smartphones. Raise your hand if you have a smartphone in your pocket. There we go. Social media, how many of you use Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram? Uh, Google Plus, sorry, Google Plus anyone? And, you know, the ability to start Twitter spats with the general public. I mean, this is something that has never happened before. And so you know, President Trump earlier this year convened a very high profile meeting of the Silicon Valley elite. And it's very obvious that technology is, as an industry, trusted. And it's here to stay. And it's really leaned upon to shape the policies that affect us as citizens of the United States. So I wanted to ask you, John, what you see as your privilege and your responsibility as a super successful tech founder in our democracy. Wow. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always sad. And my grandfather used to say to me, to those who much is given, much is expected. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's part think of someone the... told Peter Parker that, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah, it's yeah, a good one. It's in the good book. It's, it's a um, good one. I, I think that's why. We feel it's part of our, our, like our mission is to maximize people's money for them. It is to take financial services into the future to make it something that really works for people. Mm -hmm. Technology allows us to do that better than ever before. There's a lot of inertia because of all the regulations in financial services, right? And some of that is good because you don't want people just coming up and uh, doing risky or crazy things uh, with your money, especially because money is hard to understand, and so there's a lot of regulation around it. And that a lot of that regulation came out in the 1930s, and 1940, and the 1970s. It was the last time we had significant financial regulation changes. That means that it's outdated. It all came about in a time before computers. And as technology is changing, the regulations are racing to catch up. Just a couple weeks ago, the SEC issued its first public guidance on robo-advisors. Betterment was all over that paper. I mean, our, uh, our language that we've you know, spoken with them about appeared in there about the ways that we think things should be done. And it's our obligation, and we talk about this a lot, in not just the way that we maximize your money, but the security procedures that we use, the compliance procedures that we use, the disclosures and the transparency. It's our obligation to set the standard for the future of the industry. Because everyone's watching us. Everyone's mm -hmm. copying us. Everyone's doing what we're doing and saying, if Betterment can do that, then we can do that. We've got to do it right. And that's a huge burden on us. But it's one that we and the team are really excited about it. Because it's so amazing to see if you're a lawyer working at Betterment 
and you're seeing your work appear in SEC briefs. Wow, that's exciting. You know, mm -hmm. we're shaping the industry. It's exciting if you're in security, right? Like the, the kinds of things that we're doing. So, what do you think about though the amplified voice that tech leaders seem to have in the U.S.? You know, I think. CEO of Uber is a great example of how he was both like really trusted by the president, but also under such scrutiny by users that he had to distance himself. What do you make of that? Oof. <laughs> it's a burden, you know, but I think it's such a privilege too. I feel like I have the best job in, in the world, right? Like I just feel really lucky to build a team that I want to work with, to, uh, to build a company that's doing something that we're all passionate about, uh, and I get to come to work and work on that. I mean, what a privileged time and place in, in human history. Totally. To be a young person. I'm 37. Maybe I'm not a young person you still anymore, count? but I still count. On behalf um, of young people. <laughs> yeah. But I still think of myself as a young person. To be able to build a company and to be able to do things that I want to do and to engage our minds generation ago, you couldn't do that, much less a thousand years ago. Uh, it's just the mobility that we have, the opportunity that we have is incredible. I want to continue to provide that to more, more and more people. Mm -hmm. It is truly a choice time to be alive yeah. and to be building a company. Yeah. We unfortunately didn't have enough microphones to pass around the audience for the Q&A section, so I've transcribed the questions that were asked and will restate them, then play John's answers for the rest of the podcast. I was able to get most names, but to the guy in the gray shirt, I'm sorry I didn't catch yours. Feel free to tweet at me. Catherine Thayer from Forbes asked a great question about adding extra layers of personalization. She said, when I signed up for Elvest, they asked me about my gender, career, compensation goals, financial views, and more. What do you think the value is in personalization and what is Betterment doing to make it a more personal experience? I am a believer in personalization of portfolios. And you may not be aware of some of the personalization that, that we do already. I, there are no two portfolios at Betterment that are alike. Everyone actually has a, a portfolio that's uniquely built for them. For uh, If you're in New York, you, you can get New York muni bonds. If you're in California, you can get California muni bonds. If you're in all tax deferred accounts, your portfolio will be different from somebody who's in taxable accounts. And we'll optimize every cash flow so that even if you and I signed up and did the survey exactly the same way, but you signed up uh, at 10 AM and I signed up at 2 PM, because of the, the way our cash flows are processed, our portfolios are going to be different because we're optimizing for, for different situations. That's part of the advantage of building in a way that's independent of product. Right? We don't have to, we're not trying to put you into a fund with 5 million other people who are kind of similar to you, but their tax situation is different, their actual personal, you know, personal preferences are different. Um, we're able to really personalize for you. And to me, that's part of the power of this next generation of financial services companies is it can be more, more personalized. So I'm a big believer in it. We've got a number of portfolios on the platform now. We've got a a partnership with uh, Goldman Sachs Asset Management, where we have uh, their portfolios. We've got a partnership with Vanguard. Where we've got an all, all Vanguard portfolio. And, and customers are opting into these kinds of things if, if that's what they want to do. Uh, and I think you'll see more and more of that, of that over time. Guy in the gray shirt said, some people think that the portfolio model theory for wealth management is an outdated one. Do you agree with this? What is Betterment doing to continually adjust a client's portfolio based on changing risk factors in the market? So the question is, is modern portfolio theory dated and are there better models out there to think about how to diversify a, a, a portfolio? I think all models are wrong. Some are helpful. There is no perfect way to diversify. There is no perfect way to build a portfolio because unfortunately we can't see the future. And you know, if we could, well, we'd know exactly what to invest in. You just want to try to do your best to spread your bets because diversification works. That's known. But how exactly to allocate between the things? I mean, we could probably poll. There's a bunch of experts probably in, in, in the room, and, and including you, I'd expect, who would have good and correct views about a way to diversify. And we might not all agree about what that is. What's far more valuable than how you diversify assets across asset classes are things like, how do you minimize costs within that asset class? Are you looking for the lowest cost ETF with the least tracking error for the thing that, that you want to uh, be tracking? 
and the lowest trading cost of anything, and how do you minimize those trading costs? How do you optimize around taxes? How do you make sure that people are saving enough in the right types of accounts over time? How do you control for behavior? All of those things that I just mentioned actually create a bigger drag on your returns than whether you had more emerging markets or more developed markets in, in your portfolio. Because they're known, repeatable, happen every year, and we can optimize all of those things to create significant real alpha for our, for our customers in a way that different diversification strategies can't. John Zettler from Commandive had a great question about competition. He asked, is your business defensible based on brand or based on thin margins that make it hard for anyone else to build the five years of tech you've invested in and run as lean as you can? How do you think about the ability for someone else to come in and replicate the Betterment model? So how do we think about barriers to entry? There are a number of things that make it difficult to launch a financial services company in the first place, as everyone who, who works in, the, in this space knows. Some of those are regulatory. Some of them are, are capital constraints. Some of them are brand and, and the inertia. Boy, it's a hard and expensive thing to do. And so as far as new startups coming into, the, into this space, We've just got, we've got a significant lead and we've got a growing lead over all of them. And I, I think that'll continue to, to carry us. It doesn't mean that we don't have to always be innovating, right? We do. Like, and that's, that's if, if we stop innovating, well, then we're, we're going to be ripe for disruption. So we've got to continuously invest in our customer-centric approach, in building more for our customers and delivering more value back to them and constantly driving our costs down so we can provide more value to our customers. As long as we do that, we've got a lead. We're going to continue to extend that lead. I look at uh, Amazon uh, often as a, as a parallel. I think they've done a great job of building a franchise that delivers a lot of value to customers and continually driving that value as they make more money, continually driving that value back to customers. That's what I want to do with, with Betterment. And there will always be, be challengers, as there have been for, for Amazon. But you've got to keep, uh, as long as you're driving that, that value back, it's, it, it gets hard, harder and harder for people over time to, to challenge that, the, the value that, that you're delivering. So we'll launch Betterment X soon and work on delivery <laughs> for ETF. I don't know if going to Mars is going to be my thing. Um, that, that, like, Glimpse in the people, sky. I, people have got that well covered, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I do, you know... Like, you, it, probably it's, it's transparent what I care about. You know, I, I, I care a lot about um, human happiness and access to opportunity and, and, and equality of opportunity and things like that. Miriam Eves from the Cargill Group asked, why do you think you were able to get ahead of the pack and never went to a B2B model? There were a lot of other people who tried in the wealth space and didn't succeed, and funding wasn't necessarily the problem. I guess I'm just a glutton for punishment. I guess I just like I like my job, you know. Like I, uh, I and, and it is hard work, but I love I love what we're doing, um, and uh, I love the the change that, that we're making. I love that we're changing the industry. Right, the, the industry is, is it's different today. That, I mean, that's 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 so exciting. It's and it's happening. Right, whatever happens to us, the industry has changed. Uh, wow, what a you know, just like what a what a privilege to to, to, to be able to say. So, do that. you think it was timing? I think a lot of it's timing. I mean, I think that about most things, right? I, I, I'm not a believer in the kind of great, great man theory of, of history. I think uh, oftentimes when you see innovations, they come up multiple places at the same time, and it was just the time was, was right for that thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and in this case, in our case, we're standing on, on the shoulders of, of so many giants. I mean, I you know, thank goodness for uh, Jack Bogle, um, who said, you know, well, we should create a, an index fund. Um, and, uh, and, and that took decades to become popular. It wasn't, you know, created in the 70s, became popular in the 90s, um, and was still a small company in, until the 2000s, <laughs> really. Um, we, uh, uh, you know, thank goodness for ETFs that came out in the 90s and took a long time to become popular because, because of ETFs, we can, uh, we can trade very efficiently and we have lower costs uh, in creating globally diversified portfolios than ever before. Um, you know, I hate to say it a little bit, but thank goodness for the high-frequency traders um, who have, uh, um, you know, not always um, in the most transparent ways made, made their, their billions, but have invested so much money in technology that trading is essentially free today, uh, and it costs us nothing to, to execute. 
Uh, and so that's, uh, that's incredible. So, so investors can get a better deal today because technology has changed and because some of these fundamental building blocks have changed, it's time for a different layer on top of that to help them interpret and process it. Financial services is so much more complicated than it used to be. You need more of a processing and artificial intelligence layer on top to help make sense of it and to do the right things. That, I believe, is the future of financial services, is taking all these really sophisticated building blocks and packaging them up in ways that are personalized uh, for, for people that, that make sense for, uh, for, for you individually. Jane Barrett from Goldbean asked, so it's a great ambition to be the go-to brand for the next 100 years, but really, what's next for you guys? <laughs> I, there, there's a lot that I can't talk about, right? Like, there's a lot of things that I can't say. Uh, and that's not always because like, we have like, you know, this giant secret lab, but it, it's things that you would expect. You know? it's, um, and, and, and we're, of course, looking at all the opportunities that are out there. Our, our ambition is to be our customer's central financial relationship because we want to give them advice about their full financial life. Uh, and there are so many different approaches into that um, because financial lives are complex. Uh, our, the, the challenge is not... What are the ideas? Uh, I think the ideas are, 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 are all out there. And in fact, almost every idea that, that, that we have, there is a company doing that thing and specifically working on that, that problem. Uh, it, to me, it's about prioritization and tying those things together in a way that makes sense for, for our customers who are coming to us for our value proposition today, which is, I want you to maximize my money for me. Ryan Eisenman from Routier asked, you mentioned that most of your clients are highly educated on the wealthier side and are generally very sophisticated investors. How are you looking to bring non-consumers who have been alienated by finance into the fold, even though they aren't and may not be part of a super profitable investor base? Boy, <laughs> I would love to level the playing field uh, and to, uh, to, to somehow give better economic access and opportunity to everyone. But one of the, um, the facts of, of uh, America in 2017, and, and for some time, is that about 50% of the country is in debt. Um, about 50% of the company is saving. Of that 50% that's saving net, half of them don't have enough savings to really be investing. Right? They're, they've got a small savings account. So we're really talking about the top 25% people who's investing. And if you look at college graduates or something like 25, 30%, you know, I'm going to say 30, you're basically talking about college educated people who can, who can, who can do this, who can, who can invest. So whether we like it or not, that's, that's our target market. Like that's the only people that, that we can really address. What do we do for everyone else? It is, um, it's not a problem I can fix today. It's a problem that you know, has to be fixed through redistribution, basically, um, and, and how you think about access to means of production. I mean, I, it, like, I, I'm going to have to go back and read my economics books a, a, little, a little bit. Uh, I wish I could do more, more about it. Uh, and we'll do what we can from, from our position to make our advice accessible to, to everyone who, who wants it. So maybe we can reach more of those people. John, thank you so much for coming in today. And thank you all for participating.